right, well, with that, we are going to get started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library, and I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's talk with Dick Snyder, titled, Why Are We So Divided and What Can We Do? Published in January of this year, Dick Snyder's book, A Future Without Walls, Confronting Our Divisions, is considered an essential is considered essential reading for those who long for an end to our, the social divisions and hope those who hope for a new era. In the book, Dick discusses steps that we can take as individuals, communities, and society that can help bring us together. But in order to act effectively, he says we must try to understand why we are so polarized. In this presentation, Dick will touch on these topics and more. I would like to thank the UU Church of Belfast for co-sponsoring tonight and helping to promote the event. Uh, again, before we get started, I'd like to let you know the program is being recorded and to remind you to please keep your mics muted and put your questions in the chat and we will get to them um, during the Q&A period at the end. Uh, Professor Emeritus of Theology and Ethics and former academic dean at New York Theological Seminary, Dick retired to Maine and then served for two years as academic dean of Bangor Theological Seminary. He founded the Restorative Justice Project of the Mid-Coast, co-founded the Restorative Justice Institute of Maine, and has served on numerous local and statewide boards. A former resident of both Northport and Camden, he and his wife currently live in Topsom. So thank you for joining us tonight, Dick. With that, I will turn the mic over to you. Um, okay. Thank you, Brenda. Me, someone's talking, just a second. Please, before Dick gets started, can you please keep your mics muted? Thank you. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Dick. Dick, the mic's All right, yours. I'm allowed to talk. Uh, yes. Good. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Brenda, I want to thank you specifically for your work at the library over all these years. Somebody's not muted. I know. I just got them. Okay. <clears throat> and I want to thank the UU Church for their co-sponsorship of this event and for the Restorative Justice Project, which has, I know, put this uh, on Facebook. So. It's a delight to be with you all. I wanna begin my comments with a word about why I find myself so engaged in the struggle both to understand our divisions and then to take steps that might bridge some of the gaps that now exist. Please note I said some of the gaps and might. Uh, this is not a uh, question and answer with me being the answer person, but uh, a chance for us to explore together. Some of you know I wasn't always concerned about our divisions. In fact, in my early years, the division seemed natural, something we took for granted. Uh, I'm sorry, this is... Yeah, okay. Um, something that I took for granted, at least, uh, everything seemed natural. It seemed natural to me that Blacks lived in a different part of our township, in small houses with dirt roads, while we Whites lived in larger homes with paved roads. It seemed natural because I was taught that poverty among Blacks was due to their laziness, their lack of culture, or their basic ineptness. It seemed natural that the relationship between men and women was one of boss and underling that marriage was only between a man and a woman, that women were subservient. It seemed natural that being straight was the way God intended, and any form of sexuality that deviated from that was a perversion. It all seemed so natural. The change in my opinions and beliefs came very slowly, at least until I went to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, when something happened to me as a seminary intern, I had been blithely unaware of the consequences of the way things were. I knew nothing, Black history, the struggle for human rights that had been going on in the States, or the struggles for women and for their rights, or of the closeted LGBTQ plus persons, or the fight for some countries for independence from colonial control. I knew nothing of that but that cocoon of unawareness was burst open for me one night while dining in the home 
of a wealthy expatriate when the conversation turned to the starving people of the Northeast. I innocently asked of the host what he proposed to do about the starving peasants. He replied coldly, let them die. At that moment, something snapped in me. I began to search for why so many were dying, why so many people were poor and others wealthy and well-fed. It started me on a journey that I've been on ever since, but it wasn't simple, nor was it a straight line. There have been several problems. One of the problems I've discovered is that the struggle to overcome the division is a lifelong struggle. One doesn't, or at least I don't, simply overcome these deep divisions that characterize my life. In many ways, I'm like a recovering alcoholic. I'm a recovering racist, a recovering sexist, and so forth. I'm reminded of that each time I remain silent in the face of a divisive joke or comment or when a long forgotten trope rushes into my mind. Another thing I've discovered is that the divisions are not simply a problem for us as individuals. They are rooted in our systems of justice, our culture, our comedy, our religion, our economics. St. Paul says, we are wrestling against principalities and powers. We're dealing with systemically rooted problems. So transformation must include both belief and attitude changes and changes in the way our society is structured, our politics, our economy, our media, our culture, our religions. The third problem that I found is that othering is complex. It's not just a problem of whites versus black. The problem is that included in my othering are people who voted for Trump, anti-vacciners, vaccinators, anti-maskers, those with extreme white ring views, those who disagree with me on policies, regulations, climate change, candidates. Well, I've identified with the uh, struggles of those I formerly was against. Now I find myself categorizing those with whom I disagree as ignorant, uninformed, or even worse, as enemies. Lamentably, I have come to consider many of them other. This uh, clipboard is not working right. So this has led me to take a very long, hard look at the divisions that now exist between the haves and the have nots, the rural and urban folks, whites and blacks, citizens and immigrants, straights and gays, gun advocates, and those who oppose guns. I don't suggest for a minute that those who advocate guns without limits or sending immigrants back to their former country or the cheerleaders for white supremacy are correct. I believe they're wrong, but I also think it's incumbent upon us to understand what has led them to their beliefs and actions. Why do people vote against their own interests? Why do they continue to support trickle-down financial policies that further increase the wealth gap? Why do they consider affirmative action to be preferential treatment for undeserving Blacks and other people of color at their expense? Why do they elect politicians who consistently resist environmental re regulations that would save their land, their water, their air, their jobs? Why? That's the question that I have to ask. There are at least three reasons. The first, there are systemic divisions and there's ignorance and there's fear. There are probably more reasons as well. Our history is one of systemic divisions. There have been laws that supported black slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, and mass incarceration. Each one of these laws is a, each one of these laws is really a, a problem for our society. And they've created a divide between us and them. There have been laws that have kept people of the same sex from being together, from making love or marrying. There have been laws that uh, make, make it impossible for Native Americans 
to live anywhere other than on reservations. There have been laws that have prohibited Asians from immigrating to the United States at times. In addition to these laws, the culture has shaped our divisions. The portrayals of Indians as brutal, blackface portrayals of smiling, shuffling blacks, portrayals of women as either Madonnas or whores. Our religions too have taught us to revile others. Our history is replete with systemic ways to divide us. Isabel Wilkerson in her great book, Cast, notes how Hitler and the Nazis learned from US laws that asserted white supremacy and purity, laws against interracial marriage, laws for segregation. The Nazis were greatly influenced by our laws and our treatment of blacks, and they became significant examples for how they would treat Jews, Roma, gays, and communists. They learned from our movies and cartoons as well. Their systemic gen genocide drew upon our systems. In addition to systemic divisions, there is ignorance. Keeping people ignorant allows those in power to remain in control. They distort or even hide the truth. The truth about Tulsa when whites burned down the black center of the town and killed many of its people. The truth about the Civil War, which was anything but civil, was not a war about states' rights, as is often claimed, but rather to maintain slavery. The truth about the plight of women, women who won an abortion because of rape or the financial ability to feed another mouth, inability to feed another mouth. The truth about science and climate change. Instead of truth, they offer conspiracy theories that instill additional ignorance and they blame the victims for their ignorance and for the way things are. All this to build power. Ignorance guarantees power at the expense of truth. Another reason for our divisions is fear. Catherine Kramer and Ari Hochschild helped me understand why people have bought a line that they believe why their lives are in a downward spiral. Kramer spent months with people in rural Wisconsin who voted for Scott Walker and Donald Trump. She found that they are afraid that their world is falling apart. They're afraid that their children's lives will be worse than theirs. They are told it is big government that is failing them by siphoning money, money to undeserving blacks in the cities. So they join the chorus of voices that call for whites to remain in or to get back in control. To make America great again for them means that blacks and immigrants and other people of color become their enemies. They're being told that they are losing out because others are winning and they're afraid. Hope Child spent months with persons in Southern Louisiana who voted with the Tea Party and who supported the very corporations and lack of regulations that were destroying their livelihoods, their water, and their homes. They were afraid of the way things were going and they looked to the Tea Party for a way out. And in their fear, they joined a litany of whites against black, rural against urban, local against big government, right against left. I've come to understand that they are right to be afraid. Their future is bleak and it's even bleaker for their children. I understand why they feel left out, forgotten and bypassed. I understand why they feel the center is not holding but they are looking to the wrong way forward. They're placing the, their hopes in those who are dividing us. And so they become part of the great division. I also understand why they are listening to and supporting those who lie to them and make matters worse by turning against the very people with whom they need to be in solidarity. The other people who are similarly bypassed and exploited. When those who have been routinely killed have cried out, Black lives matter. There are some who respond, ah, but all lives matter. Now with that slogan, some are buying into the divisions of hatred and rejection, but others are saying, my life matters. Don't forget about me. Mills have closed, robots have taken their jobs. 
They now live from hand to mouth with little or no financial security. So they are frightened and feel forgotten. But that need not deny the plight of others. Their fears and pain cannot be at the price of ignoring the pain of the parents whose children are being killed, of the disproportionate number of young black men who are being incarcerated, or of the fears of a Native American that their reservation is being poisoned by pollution, underdevelopment, addictions, and marginalization. Lest you think I'm watering down the enormous divisions of our world, let me set the record straight. We dare not relax in our struggle against the egregious divisions of race, gender, visibility, physical ability, income, etc. But equally dangerous is the tendency to create a hit parade of oppressions. Rather than an ordering of severity, I have come to believe that each of these divisions is rooted in the same foundation. What they have in common is the treatment of people as other. It is possible for our differences to be respected, valued, and even celebrated. But rather than treating our differences as cause for celebration, they've become now cause for division. I use the term other or othering to designate the full range of treating persons as those people, from denigration to extermination from casting them as inferior to considering them enemies, even inhuman. Once we categorize someone as other, it's possible to ignore them, belittle them, treat them, uh, them as in instruments, abuse them, discriminate against them, or in the most hideous of circumstances, to massacre them. To other someone is to view them as a different order of being, and in some cases, such as in the Holocaust or slavery, as not even human. The distinctions are viewed as so essential that they create an unbridgeable gap between oneself and the other. In every case, the divisions lead to psychological and or physical violence. Today, I fear the divisions are increasing. We should not ignore the progress made in overcoming some of the formal or de jure divisions. Some people point those out and deservedly so. Civil rights laws have been enacted. Marriage equality has been approved and so forth. These victories should be celebrated and acknowledged. But the divisions continue and in some cases are growing. Young blacks are being murdered. Our capital has been attacked. Mass killings are on the rise. Women continue to be abused. People are being pigeonholed, identified by their tribe, treated as other. We now experience this during COVID with the vitriol between maskers and anti-maskers, between those who will accept vaccines and those who will not. As I've shown in my book, there are many reasons why we're so divided and it's important that we understand why things are as they are. Until we do, we will be flailing at windmills, marching in vain, pouring money down drains, and praying to no avail. The book Cast sets forth how racism is embedded in a class system that has characterized our nation since its inception. In doing so, Isabel Wilkerson has exposed the interrelationships that have set us against one another. This is similar to what I speak of as the interwoven connectedness of all forms of othering. Now, it's painfully clear that Blacks are upset because their marginalization, brutalization, and killings are on the rise. Only the blind of those or those with blinders fail to see their plight. But the fear, loss, marginalization of many of our white folks also demands our attention. Many of us live in a bubble that leaves us ignorant of the plight of so many of our rural neighbors, whose jobs are being eliminated, farms are being foreclosed, healthcare facilities are being shut down, and town facilities are withering. Let me be clear. I'm not suggesting for one minute that the plight of a family in Northern Maine in which the father has lost a decent paying job, the mother is exhausted from caring for her five children whom she can barely feed, the mortgage is in arrears, the kids' futures are now in question, and all hope seems gone. 
I'm not suggesting that their plight is the same as or severe as that of a single black mother whose son has just been killed by the police or the millions of black parents who live in fear that their children will not return home safely from school or from being in the playground or driving a car. But it's critical in our search for justice that we not lose sight of both plights. We have to move beyond a hit parade of othering. They are inextricably intertwined and that's what makes it so confusing. If we're faced with only one issue, things would be easier. We could throw ourselves fully into that one battle. But the fact is that there are many forms of othering, so it can seem overwhelming. So I ask, how do we then decide which form of othering we should respond to? Even before deciding what we should do, we need to imagine the impossible. We need to live with hope. Sometimes I know it feels like nothing we do matters. Sometimes it feels like nothing fundamental will change. I've certainly been there feeling that we are doomed. I've been tempted to give up and move to another country. The forces of the status quo seem overwhelming. And City Hall seems that we can't fight it. There's too much money and too much power in the hands of the wealthy. It doesn't seem to matter who gets elected. The government is dysfunctional and so it goes. And we are tempted to throw up our hands in resignation, to, dis to despair of ever breaking down the walls that divide us. I know that feeling. But change has happened in the past, so why not now? If apartheid can be ended, if the Berlin Wall can be come down, if Jim Crow laws can be eliminated, if same-sex marriage can become legal, then surely there is hope. It won't be easy, it won't be forever, it won't be perfect. There will always be more to do, but we can do something. So what do we do? First, let's see who's been placed in our path. Who are the most immediately in need and for how long has this been going on? One thing that's always struck me about the story of the Good Samaritan is so many good people turned a blind eye to the plight of the battered person in their path. They walked right by. Perhaps they felt some sorrow, but they walked by. But the despised Samaritan saw the person in need and did what he could. I know that many of you are like the Good Samaritan. You have care, found it in your heart to care for and about the plight of those in your path. It's always been this way. If we consider both our personal efforts and funds to address the othering that is going on, even our, and even our institutional histories, we can see the shifting of priorities at work. For example, if we look at our own patterns of giving, we may see shifts over time. Look at your own giving history, your own involvements. And I'm sure most of you will see a kaleidoscope when it comes to organizations and movements that you've supported. It's equally true of institutions. For example, many religious denominations have developed a changing focus every three or five years to overcome divisions. They've emphasized gay marriage, systemic racism, women's rights, mass incarceration, indigenous people's needs. The only pattern we can discern is the attempt to respond to the most immediate and egregious forms of othering. We also have to think though about those who have been removed from our path. I recall one time driving from the airport in Santo Domingo past blocks of lovely homes and trees, but I discovered that they were a false facade designed to hide degradation Behind that beauty were the tin and scrap and wood shacks of those living in desperate poverty. There have been many people who have been made invisible behind the false facade of development. Several weeks ago, we celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day. But apart from that one day, most Native Americans are invisible. They've been placed on reservations by our government and largely forgotten. There are others we keep largely invisible. One of the primary functions of our prison system is to keep those we consider human waste out of sight, out of mind. It's why we move the homeless from highly visible sites to the margins of our town and cities. In these circumstances, it's our task to go out of the way, off of our common path 
to encounter those who have been other, othered by their marginalization, their silencing, and their invisibility. If we want to begin to make a difference, it's critical that we carefully assess who is being othered, by what means, and how are we affected or impacted by their othering. Since there are so many people who are being othered, who are suffering in our divided world, and you can name them, trans, immigrants, women, Native Americans, Jews, Muslim, white trash, and more. I've decided tonight to focus on just two groups, two groups we cannot and should not ignore. They are the Blacks, and who have been historically the most consistently, persistently, and virulently and tragically othered. Their voices will not let us remain deaf to their plight. The second group are those who made us, we've made other because they are against masks or vaccine or voted for LePage or against Roe v. Wade or against, against same-sex marriage or who blame blacks for the problems facing our nation. They're all around us on the street corner in Belfast at school board meetings among our neighbors and in our families. I begin with blacks as they have been systematically and personally considered less than human, fit only for exploitation, second-class citizenship, and crumbs from the table. The cry Black Lives Matter is the most recent public outrage expressed by the black community, but it, has been a, it is a cry that has been with us for centuries. Think back to the spirituals. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child, a long way from home. Eric Dyson's powerful sermon to white America, Tears We Cannot Stop, begins with a question, how can we make it through the long night of despair? Blacks have been systematically used, abused, and discarded. In today's outrageous number of blacks being killed by police and vigilantes, their exclusion from the American dream, their treatment of as less has made them the most visible, the least of these are brothers and sisters. The case can be made that many others have been thrown on the ash heap of history. But when you add chattel slavery to marginalization and killing, black lives not only matter, they are claiming an essentialness we can no longer ignore. So what can we whites do in the face of such despair? What can we do to embrace those who have been, have been and continue to be othered by police killings, mass incarceration, inadequate pay, poor housing, and personal affronts? After a week sailing together in Penobscot Bay, a black friend of mine exclaimed, boy, it sure is white up here. Fair enough. Since we are the or one of the whitest states in the nation, we lack much of the direct contact with blacks who have been systematically treated as other. But that should not and dare not stop us from addressing the racism that is endemic to our society. There are some things we can do to deal with racism that is dividing our nation. For starters, we need to be in touch with our own racism. Sometimes it's overt and obvious, sometimes covert and unintended. I'm reminded of the story told by Wilkerson about an editor with Look Magazine. <clears throat> Despite his rejection of racism, there was a certain madness in him when it came to direct dealing with Blacks. When shaking hands with Blacks, he felt he was unclean and needed to wash his hand. That was his madness. Each of us needs to face the madness to which we have been conditioned. I believe that madness is a correct name for the racism which most of us have been inoculated with. Recognizing the madness, we need to move beyond guilt to accept responsibility to change the way things are. Wallowing in guilt will get us nowhere. We are only guilty if we refuse to act, only if we remain bystanders. We cannot lead the fight, but we can be part of it. In addition to dealing with our own racism, there's much we can do to make ourselves and our children and our grandchildren aware of a history that has been denied us, a world that has been kept invisible, cries that have been silenced. There's no excuse for not knowing the history of slavery or Jim Crow or redlining or mass incarceration or Tulsa, 
We can read James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Michael Eric Dyson, Isabel Wilkerson, and others who share the pain of the Black reality. We have no excuse to be uninformed. One thing we can do bringing down the walls to divide us is to become aware of the Black experience. And that means, I think, working with local school boards to ensure that Black history is more than a one-month focus on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And includes events such as Jim Crow, the, the race massacre in Tulsa, lynchings, mass incarceration. We need to do all in our power locally to prevent a cancel culture movement from burying our past. There's a movement here in Maine to silence the teaching of racism. It hides behind the false claim of critical race theory, but that's a lie. Critical race theory is an academic pursuit limited to law schools and graduate schools. But talking about the ways in which racism has been at work in our nation is anathema to some. There are attempts to silence teachers who tell the facts about the treatment of blacks. We need to support our teachers and school board members who speak about our true history. And some of us can run for our local school boards. We can also become advocates for black empowerment. We can march and write and speak on behalf of legislation that will move us toward justice for all. There's much that needs to be done legislatively. At the state and national level, we can support legislation that seeks to empower the disempowered. that provides affordable housing, healthcare, and educational opportunities for those long denied. We can, be, we can advocate on behalf of the John L. Lewis Voting Rights Act. We can support the legislation that recently improved by Maine and, and signed by Governor Mills that requires an assessment of the racial impact of all legislation and work for that to become a national movement. We can use social media to advocate for Black empowerment. There's much we can do. And let me say finally about support of the Black struggle. We can help fund organizations and groups for Blacks whenever possible, led by Blacks. There are many such organizations and deciding which one or ones to support can be confusing. Some have expressed reluctance to give money, wondering if their money would be misused or wasted. I submit these questions and risks are no different from our own investment or donations. There are always risks. If we look at the various large nonprofits many of us may have supported, which ones have been without serious issues? For example, the high percentage of income charged to administration, the failure to deliver as promised, consolidation at the expense of local chapters, corruption in leadership, and so forth. But despite the risks, we've donated because the needs seem to warrant the risk. Now it's time to do so with Black organizations and those that empower the Black community. Now is not a time to worry about risk taking. More can be said and done about our response to the othering of Blacks, but let me turn now to the different experience of othering, namely our othering of those with whom we disagree. We live in a state that supported Donald Trump and Paula Page, a state in which All Lives Matter signs are posted to compete often with Black Lives Matter signs, a state in which parents have challenged school boards about critical race theory, a town in which an anti-masker pushes a protester into the line of traffic, a state in which Fox News is the principal news source for many. In other words, we live in a state that is divided between us and them. And as a result, some of us have come to view those with whom we disagree as other. So it's time to look at ourselves, at our own reactions and responses to our divisions. I have found myself thinking that the people with whom I disagree vehemently, are ignorant, gullible, even evil. I'm constantly tempted to reject out of hand their reasoning and their circumstances. I think to myself, why don't they just join with us and make things better? Why do they see us as the enemy? Why do we end up at each other's throats? What can we do to minimize the divisions between us and them? For some, the answer is to avoid any conversation that focuses on our divisions. I've heard from a number of people who never bring up anything in their family that might cause a rift and exacerbate the divisions. But there are things we can do beyond avoidance. 
In a future without walls, I've suggested a number of steps we might take. The first is to develop empathy. Empathy is different from sympathy. Sympathy makes us feel sorry for our benighted opponents. Empathy requires us to go deeper, to walk in another's shoe, and to feel their pain. What would we do if we had lost our job and now we're working now for half of what we once made? What would we do if future prospect looked bleak and even worse for our kids? What would we do if we were living hand to mouth? What would we do if we felt our way of life was being threatened? Put yourself in their shoes. Once we've been able to walk in the other shoes, we may begin to reach out to seek to connect with those with whom we disagree. But one of the most counterproductive things we can tell them is that they are so much better off than blacks, that no matter how bad their plight, they are still privileged whites. Imagine if someone came to us with a shoulder pain and our response was to say, well, at least you're not quadriplegic. Of course, they're not as bad off as the person who lost her arms and legs, but we need not dismiss the pain. It's theirs and they feel it. We dare not turn our divisions into a zero-sum game in which some win and some lose, forcing the people to choose from a hit parade of oppressions. To minimize the fears and pain felt by those lives that are in shambles will only drive them further into the hands of those who play upon their fears. So let's not talk with them about white privilege. There are some who foster the divisions who are in fact privileged and they should not be excused. Their desire to maintain their privileges needs to be confronted directly. They're in a different category from the suffering poor. It's a fact that I'm a privileged person, white, male, educated, comfortably retired, a homeowner. What privileges I do have, however, are not a reason for guilt, but rather a reason for responsibility. We are called upon to use our privileges to change the circumstances that have made the playing field so uneven. So from a place of privilege that many of us have, we need to find ways to bridge the artificial divisions that threaten our democracy. It begins with making contact, but making contact is not always easy. There are bound to be suspicions. There often is not a natural way to connect, so it can feel artificial and forced. Just plunking ourselves down in some small town country store and trying to start a conversation may not lead anywhere except to our rejection. But there are some natural ways that we do connect. One of the most powerful and common ways is that we have connection within our families, even when the divisions run deep. To the extent that there is love, the shared history and some level of communication, there is hope. It may be difficult to talk with someone in the family whose position you hate, but it is possible. For example, many a parent has found themselves embracing their gay or trans child when originally they had been adamantly against anything other than straightness. Imagine the long journey that required, the dialogue that had to go on internally and externally. There's also a possibility of finding something in common with those to whom we are not related. If you visit the country store as a fellow hunter, you have established a connection that may allow for dialogue. Finding common interests in cars, sports, cooking, raising crops, wildlife, quilting, birding, etc., affords a starting point for moving beyond empathy to dialogue. Now, of course, there are some who refuse to dialogue. They remain closed. However, I've found that there are some who vehemently disagree with me on a number of things, and yet they're willing to dialogue. For each of us, the basis of such dialogue is a willingness to look at our own and others' feelings and ideas with openness. That doesn't mean capitulating and giving up what we feel is true or correct. It does not mean accepting a racist comment or ignoring the dismissal of immigrants as dangerous but it does mean a willingness to seriously consider the other's ideas, including their criticism of ours. To engage in such dialogue necessitates a willingness to make ourselves vulnerable, to trust that our vulnerability will not be held against us and to fortify ourselves if we are attacked. 
The dialogue entails that we live with the tension between vulnerability and inner strength. <clears throat> One of the most powerful examples of the possibility of empathy, connection, and dialogue is restorative justice. In that approach, persons who are divided by harm such as crime or bullying find a way to come together and work things out. Initially, the one harmed views the offender as a terrible person, even evil, whom they wish to avoid. The one causing harm often views the victim as incidental or to be used or abused as worthless. Each view the other as other. But through careful facilitation and sometimes the enormous, sometimes the enormous divisions can be bridged, bringing healing to both. The restorative justice movement is filled with stories of overcoming of divisions. None of this is easy. Empathy, connecting, and dialogue are each hard work. But just as overcoming racism demands perseverance, fortitude, and commitment, so too does overcoming the divisions between us and them, those we have considered to be other. And so I close and invite you to share your comments, questions, and experience as, as together we seek to understand why we are so divided and what we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. That was very thought provoking, very um, well put. I, there are no questions in the chat, believe it or not. <laughs> so um, I don't know how you want to handle this. If anybody has a question, I'm happy to have you unmute yourself and ask a question as long as we are um, try to be one at a time. Patty, go ahead, unmute yourself. Hi, Dick. Hi, Patty. <laughs> Guess who's here? Um, yeah. You know, one thing I've encountered and, and, and feel, I guess is what I want to say, is that, I mean, it's a great analysis that you've given us. And I think a lot of us would be sympathetic or in agreement with your feelings about a lot of these things. But being labeled uh, as a privileged white, um, I don't even like the word ally. I have some black friends, particularly Haitian American friends. And mm -hmm. someone said to me recently, oh, you're such a good ally. Uh. Uh, you know, I'm not in, the, in a war zone here, or maybe I am, but I prefer to think that we could be friends. So there is this kind of us that comes at you from the person who feels othered. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to avoid that. I don't like the term boomer either. I find that insulting. Why does everything have to be a generational discussion? So I wonder if you could speak to that boomerang effect when, <laughs> I mean, you know, reaching out to people because you find them interesting or you have something to offer, you then find yourself stamped like you've suddenly got a stamp on your head i've even been called a limousine liberal i've never been in the limousine in my life i think i need to do something about that but could you speak to could you speak to my troubles thank you dick <laughs> uh i we've all been labeled obviously and uh there are a number of labels that i would reject along with you uh, many of them seem to me to be unhelpful. Um, indeed, I think the label privilege is an unhelpful one most of the time. Uh, I accept the fact that I am privileged, but uh, I do not think that that carries a lot of weight. I think what we need to do is figure out what are our assets and strengths and what do we do with them? What are we using? Whatever we have uh, for, for good. Um, so, and the generational stuff, yeah, well, I'm at the age now where <clears throat> uh, I can look back on every generation and think that they uh, don't know what they're talking about, but uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, it's very unhelpful to, uh, there, there are some young people who are just dynamite and uh, I think they are, they have the possibility of, of 
helping us understand and see things in new ways. And I think we need to be open to all of these, quote, generations and not, uh, not even divide ourselves along those lines. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, Patty, or not. But, and I could give you a ride in a limousine if, if I could find one, but. Uh, sure, uh, it's a deal. And there's about 60 people who just heard you say that. So uh, rain check, thank you. <laughs> All right, is there another person that has to, has a question, a pressing thought? Um, please unmute yourself. I can't see everybody, so. Just go ahead and unmute yourself and start talking. Hi, hi, Dick. This is Bob Grove Markwood. Oh, hi, Bob. Um, yeah. Bob. Uh, listen, I, I deeply appreciated the the self um, the self revealing and vulnerable um, nature of your book. Um, that, that that I thought that was as important as anything else that happened in there. Your ability to to look in look at yourself um, with that kind of uh, vulnerability. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. My question is really about um, an appreciation for for the the empathy uh, framing that you bring to this. Um, as a father of a gay man, it was never my experience of thinking that was a bad thing. So the recognition of it came naturally. But I've also been recently in conversation with a, a family member, a cousin, who's been in, sort of coming after me, <laughs> coming after me that, that my own response maybe. Um, inquiring of me my thoughts about critical race theory. Um, someone who's had an education, was a, a, a hospital administrator, a large hospital actually. So not someone who's um, of that sort of, we might categorize uh, in a stereotypically ignorant, um, right. a well-informed person, but was just that uh, sort of, what do I think about that? So in trying to engage him, I feel like I'm running up against a wall <laughs> because I, you know, articles and my own sense of things and trying to say much of what you've already said here in, in that limited section. But my concern is more about my own awareness of timelines and how, how, how much time does empathy and the work of empathy and the kind of relationship building that you talk about, yes, we can go into the the, this, the local store and, you know, start meeting people and, and have those, those things that we share in common that become at least a small base upon which we might build. But the building, it feels like, can take a long time. Um, Presque Isle Congregational Church that you know I served for 25 years, just this last weekend voted to become an open and affirming congregation. Uh, for those of you, I think probably most of this audience may know what that means. So that that was a tremendous thing, but not something I was able to achieve on my watch, um, though we had discussions and maybe there were some seeds that were planted. But it, I'm just aware of 25 years in one location, the number of people who ever said to me, um, they changed their mind about something in this, in this genre of, of social justice and things, uh, it was fairly small. So how do you see the timeline for this type of thing? Do we have time? And I guess my question is more about the urgency of climate change, for example. How, are, there, are there insights that you're feeling, yes, about empathy, yes, about relationship building, but are there any ways in which we can um, make things happen a little more quickly? Uh, do you have a sense of that? And thank you so much for this book. Uh, thanks, Bob. I, I don't think there's any substitute for time. Um, do we have time? But the question, I guess, is also, if we don't have time, is there any possibility that things can change um, without taking the time? The, I, I don't know that we can win the battles around climate change, for example, <clears throat> with, uh, uh, with the troops, <laughs> I'll call them troops, on our side of that battle. Even though the people historically have said in this country, they're for alternative energy. It strikes me that the uh, powers of the purse, which are controlled by the Congress and by the administration, 
are actually controlled by individual and corporate interests that <clears throat> are pulling the strings. So I'm not certain, Bob, whether or not, even if we have the fierce urgency of change that we can accommodate, that we can accomplish it in, uh, in the manner that uh, you or I would like to see. Um, your 25 years of patience um, is remarkable up there in Presque Isle. And to see something come to fruition a few years after you've left is a statement about the way in which change occurs, I think. Uh, most of us don't expect or didn't expect change to occur as quickly as it did with respect to, for example, gay marriage. But look at the struggle of women, starting with <clears throat> Seneca Falls and working through to the uh, vote and even now with the terrific battles going on of women being considered second class of being considered uh, uh, ones you, people you can trifle with uh, without impunity or with impunity rather uh, it's it's a long 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 struggle for women to receive the same kind of respect, honor, and dignity, and sense of worth that has been granted to men. Mm -hmm. That's, it's almost 200 years. Yeah. So 25 years doesn't look like too long a time for me. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Yeah. I wish we could turn things around overnight. Yeah. And we can't. I don't think there's anything but time. Yeah. Yeah, I despair for my grandchildren. Yes. Uh, and and um, but I think Moses becomes an analog in his. He didn't see the promised land, but uh, mm -hmm. so maybe that's a a hopeful story for us as well. Yeah, and King said the same thing. Mm -hmm. I've been to the mountaintop, but he knew he wasn't going to see justice come. Thank you, Dick, so much. Um, so now we have a question in the chat, Dick, which I'll read to you. We have a couple of them, actually. But here's the first one. Many Maine schools have adopted the restorative justice practices you introduced to us during the past 10 years. What is our next step in bringing awareness of classism and racism and intersectional environmental advocacy to our young people. And that was asked by Linda. Ah, next steps. Uh, I haven't thought about that one <clears throat> actually. So here goes, nothing. <laughs> um, I think that the kids themselves are going to be the ones who drive this uh, move, uh, who, who drive the sense of justice moving forward. And I, you know, I think so many people who are older have become, uh, what's the word, inured, who have become jaundiced, uh, don't see much hope for change. But I think the kids themselves, some of them, are possibly going to provide some leadership here. So how can the restorative justice movement engage them in ways that are, they provide, they're allowed to provide the leadership that uh, I think they may become capable of, become capable of. Um, I know that there are <clears throat> often teachers that are the key to getting restorative justice into the school or administrators, but it seems to me that it's kids themselves who have to do the work. And maybe that restorative justice needs to find ways in which uh, the kids are empowered 
to do that work, to be the voices for the future? I don't know. Dick, it's good to see you. I read your book when I was visiting your sister-in-law and uh, Ms. Linda uh, Bowie. Yeah, hi, Linda. Thank you. Thank you for your book. I'm going to spend more time with it. And give it to some of the young people that I know. <laughs> Good. Good idea. I don't know what that extra noise is. Can can whoever's uh, somebody pacemaker working wrong? <laughs> okay, I no, it's somebody named Douglas Schneider. It must is he related to you? Oh. Yeah, well, anyway, right. his his mic was really bad, so I turned him off. But I have questions in the chat <clears throat> that I want to get to. OK, fine. Are you, re are you ready for the next question? Sure. OK, Jackie asks, I'd like to share one avenue created by essential partners. Has anyone in this group had experience with this organization? Our church recently hired them to facilitate a weekend workshop to train 20 people to facilitate dialogue with the goals identified by Dr. Schneider? That's a question for everybody, not for me, uh, it's for everyone. Does anybody have any contact with that group? Well, Jackie, you wanna unmute yourself and talk to us briefly? Yes, I'd, I'd love to share this. Um, okay. I'm from the Congregational Church in Topsfield, Martin Rickert, who you know. Yes. Yes. Um, he sends his greetings. Good. And um, we recently had, we, we, he was able to, we got a, a grant. It was really expensive. I mean, we looked at this group uh, some years ago and it was just too much. And if I tell you how much it costs, you'll, you'll just turn around and go away. But it was um, for an eight, a 10 hour workshop, they trained 10 of, 20 of us. We, they, we, it was all on Zoom. And the whole purpose of it was to engage in dialogue in such a way as not to try to convince anyone of our opinions, but to get acquainted with the other person. And one of the, uh, the one of the most difficult aspects of that is formulating questions that show genuine interest in understanding another person who particularly may have ideas on the other end of the spectrum. And um, that's what we're gonna wrestle with. Um, we just did this in September and uh, we haven't gotten quite, um, but the people participated with the commitment that they would be willing to, uh, as facilitators, lead these groups of you know where they get people together where there's an issue of uh, opposing opinions and again the goal isn't to convince someone else of your plan it is to to make connections to create understanding and ultimately then that can lead to um, the walls come tumbling down. And everything that you said in your book is, is, is a good explanation of why we needed to do that. And um, in my opinion, and um, so, uh, if you go to their website, it's essentialpartners.org. They have a lot of materials available um, and opportunities. Um, and then now we've got 
you know, 20 people ready to go looking for something to do with their newfound uh, talents that they have to work on. We got to work on those first. Um, but anyway, it's, it, it's, it, it's kind of like, if, have you heard of the Conversation Cafe? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's very structured. It, 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 it uses a reflective uh, structured dialogue, they call it. But it, it's, it's, it, it's, very, it's a structured approach. So it's not easy to do it in a, um, in a, a kind of informal atmosphere, like at the post office or, some, or meeting somebody in, in, um, in the neighborhood. Um, but nevertheless, the skills are ultimately the same. If you, if you I, what I see happening is developing an attitude of, you know, let me, instead of being, you know, we are so trained to be assertive and accomplish things that we lose sight of listening. But if we really spend a little more time, you know, modeling that, you know, the least we can do is model it, you know, and um, model the listening, you know, as you were saying. Well, thank you, Jackie. We have more questions coming yeah. in. Thank you for sharing that. Dick, do yeah. you have any comments about that? No, it sounds uh, like a good start. Very important okay. start. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question I have from Laura is, do you feel that all forms of othering are more prominent, immediate, and urgent than others? Well, I do. I tried to suggest that there are two, at least, that seem to me to be right in front of us <clears throat> in our path. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are the Black experience and our experience with other people who are uh, telling us to go to hell, uh, that we're wrong and we don't know what we're doing. And we, however, if one were to extend this to uh, the othering that we do to, I'll use a Buberian sense now, Buber's notion, if we were to extend this to the climate, to our planet, I think we have othered our planet as well. And that seems to me to be a critical uh, thing that I could have talked about tonight, I guess, but uh, <clears throat> don't know quite how to do it yet. But I think that uh, we have to find ways to, I, I think Buber was right in his notion that uh, we need to treat the climate itself, or the planet itself as a vow. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, move, consider that the sacredness of all that, all that is. I think the Native Americans had that sense. And uh, they were right about that, I believe. They had other senses that were wrong about, I'm sure. But that one, I think they really, they understood. So at any rate, uh, yeah, I think the two that are the most pressing for us right now in terms of persons are Blacks and um, those we disagree with in our state. And then I would add to that, there is the pressing othering going on of our climate and how we deal with that. Okay, thank you. Um, so Mariah put a really, really long comment in the chat, which Mariah, I'm not going to read that. I think it's just a recommendation for people to look up a video. If you wanna briefly unmute yourself and talk about it very briefly, we only have a few more minutes and there's another question after you. So um, if you don't, I'll just let everybody read it on their own. Thanks so much, Brenda. Um, yeah. I. Uh, this is about climate and um, 
the presentation, the it's there are actually two links here. One is to about the climate predicament itself, and the second is about interviews that this um, <clears throat> former, well, I think retired UCC minister uh, had uh, does with over seventy five people in various fields that are the they are so inspiring. So when we think about the horrible situation in that we're in. Um, <clears throat> to those interviews will be very uplifting. That's so I just, and I would love to hear from anybody who has interest in this. It's, uh, it just feels like it's something we aren't talking about that we need to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think she's talking about finding hope in the, in the websites postdoom.com. I ha I've never heard of it, but it's something to look at. Yeah, And then somebody just responded to her comment there and says she agrees, Linda agrees, children are our hope for the future and we may not see what they will do in our lifetime, but they bring me hope, she says. And I think <laughs> that a lot of people say that, where we have our hope. <laughs> so that was just a comment. Um, I think we would have time for one more question if there's something pressing out there, or somebody wants to unmute and ask. Brenda, that was in response to Dick's comment, just as this is Linda. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the I other wasn't, thing it's hard say, in the chat. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. But you know, Dick, I think the thing that you brought up that resonated with me was that it's the family members that we have, and many of us, myself sometimes included, that we avoid those hard conversations with. But it feels to me that if I can't Mm -hmm. discuss and find ways to hear the people I love in my family, even if they're really different from me, then I'm really not kind of <clears throat> meeting the bar that I've set for myself in some way that, and it's not always easy. And sometimes when they're really irrational, like some of them, some of them in my family are very irrational about the vaccine and things like that. But I have a particular one in my family who I talk with every few weeks and he's a, a Republican and one of the things I noticed, and we've both noticed, is that when you make assumptions about somebody, mm. you automatically close the door. It's just my, and, and he's done it with me, and I've done it with him, and we've, we've called each other on it. Like, oh, you just, heard the, you just listened to NPR. And I'm like, you don't know where I heard this from. That's an assumption, and that's going to put me off. And he's like, oh, yeah, right. And he's done it with me, too. And I think those kinds of dialogues where we can understand how we converse with somebody and how it impacts them so that we can be more aware can be really helpful. But you got to find the right people to do it with or the people that are more open to doing it, I guess, not the right people. So that's just my comment. But I really appreciated what you were saying about family members because I, I have lots. I have plenty of people in my family who are police officers and, you know, this is real personal for them in some ways, you know. So in many ways, so that's, that's my comment. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, Dick, do you have any last comments? No, I'm grateful for everybody's uh, participation, the questions and, and for all of your interest and, and your own commitments uh, as you've all struggled to uh, deal with the questions of the divisions in our world. I know so many of you have been really wrestling with this and doing your job. And I greatly appreciate it. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, with that, Dick, I think we're done for the night and I wanna thank everybody for coming and um, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Good, ciao. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.